Hi, everyone. So good to see you. I see everybody popping up. Hey, David. It's good to see you. I see Susan. It's great to see everyone today. Thanks for joining us. Give everyone just a second to finish getting connected. Love seeing the screens up and all of your faces. If you would open up your chat box, give me a shout out. Let us know where you're joining us from. Love to hear where all the different people are coming from that's joining us today. We have a large crowd planning to come today. Um, so it's great to, to see where everyone's joining. Um, my name is Anissa Mitchell with PMD Alliance, and I'm very excited to have you with us today. And I think that everyone's very excited about this talk. Look how fast it's popping up where people uh, from all over the place. So thanks for uh, giving us a shout out. Um, we're excited because everybody wants to know what to eat and what not to eat and how it impacts Parkinson's. So we're going to have a conversation today with Heather's Wiki, and I really encourage you to ask your questions. We're going to go through the chat. We have a ton of people on today or are planning to be on. Um, so we'll try to get to them as we can. And we are going to intersperse those in the um, presentation. She does have slides, um, but we are going to try to answer the questions as we go along. Um, so be patient as we scroll through and try to kind of aggregate some of the common questions that um, that are uh, being asked. So I want to get started because I know that we have a ton to cover. So I want to welcome Heather with us. She is actually a professor of immunology at the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, has experience in researching the effects of botanicals, probiotics, energy medicine, and diet on humans. So I know we're all very interested in hearing what she has to say, so I'm going to pass this over to you. Heather, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Anissa. And I saw somebody log on from Mankato, Minnesota. I'm from Lake Crystal, Minnesota originally, so howdy. Good to see you. Okay, we are going to talk today about nutrition and Parkinson's, and specifically what we're going to do is discuss what to eat and what not to eat. And I think to get started, we are just going to say some disclosures here. So I am an employee at the National University of Natural Medicine. I am funded by the NIH, um, specifically by the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. And I have a supplement company called Zamia Life. And uh, I won't be talking about those supplements today. So first, I just want to pose this question to you. Does nutrition affect your brain? And of course it does because nutrition affects every organ in our body, but we know specifically that what we put in as fuel is going to fuel our body. And just as it fuels our muscles and our skeletal system, it's fueling our brain. The problem is that it's not as easy as putting fuel in our car because we have a relationship with food. We use food for celebrations. We use food for um, marking an anniversary or having a gathering. And anytime we're going to do something like change our diet, we have to first examine our relationship with food. Because when I tell you that you're not supposed to eat a certain food, you may immediately put up your hands and say, absolutely not, I have to eat that food. That's how I see my grandchildren. And if that's the important thing, then the question is how can we change that relationship with food or change the food that you're sharing with those other people? And, and so I wanna recognize first that our relationship with food does not exist in a vacuum. Okay, acknowledged. Now let's move on. When we're looking at nutrition, we have different ways of studying it. And the different types of studies determines what we can get as far as information goes. So ideally, we like to look at randomized controlled trials. That's when we compare people who are eating one type of diet with people who are eating another type of diet, and it's a random comparison so that we can actually draw parallels as to what's causing one thing or another. 
The problem is most people don't like to be randomized to their diet. They like to eat what they want to eat. And so that leads us to epidemiological studies. These, these are studies where we follow what people are already doing and we see who progresses faster and who progresses slower. And we have epidemiological studies for Parkinson's and we'll talk about some of those studies and which things you can do to slow your progression of disease. We also like to look at whole diets versus single ingredients. But I'm gonna tell you about some single ingredient studies where we fed people things like blueberries and we see a difference in some of their neurological markers. The problem is you as a person isn't only gonna eat blueberries. You're gonna eat a whole diet. So we have to look at what happens when you eat a single ingredient versus you eat a whole diet. And then finally, we have animal studies. And these are what we call preclinical studies. These are studies where we're gonna look at an animal model for Parkinson's or sometimes Alzheimer's. And we're gonna see what can we do in the animal and then try to apply it back to a human. What all this is saying is that there's a complex set of data out there and different data should be trusted at different levels. For example, with epidemiological studies, we can't say anything is causative. We can't say, hey, you should drink green tea because that is preventative. We can only do that with a randomized controlled trial. So when you see conflicting data out there on nutrition, what's happening is people are studying things in different ways. And when they study things in different ways, they get conflicting data. Now here's our strategy today for looking at a diet or a, a diet strategy for you moving into the future. We know you wanna increase your brain food. We wanna increase food that is going to be good for neurological connections in the brain. We want to decrease inflammation. That means that we want to decrease the inflammatory process that is happening usually in your brain, but also in your gut for people with Parkinson's. And we want to decrease chemicals in our food. And those three things have really good epidemiological data and randomized controlled data and animal study data to show that they can slow disease progression. So how do we do those things? How do we increase brain food? Well, we'll talk about what foods are brain foods. How do we decrease inflammation? Well, we have to increase in anti-inflammatory foods. And how do we get rid of chemicals? We need to start looking at things that are, are organic and fresh. And when we do those things, um, we're going to reach our strategy. So let me give you some specifics here. First of all, let's look at the symptom of bradykinesia or slowness. We know from animal studies that berries and nuts are good at reducing bradykinesia. So if you're someone who suffers with slowness as part of your Parkinson's, there are ingredients in berries, they're called anthocyanins. So think cyan is the color blue and the darker the color of the berry, the healthier it is for your brain. So if I've got blackberries and raspberries and blueberries and strawberries here, which ones do you wanna focus on? Blackberries and then blueberries, right? And then raspberries and lastly, strawberries. And it turns out that there's another study that used mulberries, that's what's in the second picture here, that showed that the mulberries also reduce inflammation and they protect against bradykinesia in a mouse model of Parkinson's. We know that selenium, which is in Brazil nuts, is actually also really good at reducing DNA damage and reducing bradykinesia in a rat model of Parkinson's. But when you're eating Brazil nuts, I don't want you to go crazy. I know Brazil nuts, whoo, celebration, right? No, you only want to eat three to five per day. 
because the reason is that the selenium that's in Brazil nuts is healthy, but if you eat too much selenium, it promotes prostate cancer. So for you men out there, we want to keep our selenium at a good level, which is three to five Brazil nuts per day. Berries, you can go hog wild. You can eat as many of them as you want. What about tremor? When we're thinking about tremor, tremor is often caused by a vitamin B12 deficiency. Now here's something that you may not know. If you are on some form of levodopa or carbidopa, it depletes your body of B12. So it could be that when you are taking your medication, you're reducing your B12 and then you're not getting enough B12 in your diet to, to replace it. So how are you going to replace it? Well, you can replace it with eggs or meat or poultry or oysters. So any sort of protein source here, or you can take a B12 vitamin. The other thing that has been shown to reduce tremor is cannabinoids. So uh, I'm sure that some of you have tried cannabinoids or CBD for your Parkinson's, or you've gone all out and tried cannabis. Cannabis and cannabinoids have been shown to decrease tremor. So for that symptom, we're looking at B12 or cannabis. Now I said inflammation and I want to make sure we all understand what inflammation is. So we've got two major forms. The first is oxidative stress. That's a pretty new name. It used to be called free radicals. So if you guys have heard of free radicals, that's the same thing as oxidative stress. And this is something that damages your cells and causes inflammation. The other type of inflammation is caused by proteins made by your immune system called cytokines. And the crazy thing is that cytokines are causing symptoms that you experience as anxiety, depression, pain, and sleep. Got any of those issues? I know I do. I didn't sleep very well last night. That's because my cytokines are off. Now, the inflammation that happens in your joints that makes your joints hurt is the exact same inflammation that is happening in your brain. So if we can reduce inflammation, we can both reduce pain and we can reduce neuroinflammation and slow disease progression. So how are we going to do that? Well, if this is being caused by oxidative stress, as you might guess, there are going to be antioxidants that we're going to eat. And the anti-inflammatory foods include nuts. Oh, we, didn't we already talk about those? And berries. Hey, we talked about those too. And vegetables and fish. Now, let's start with our nuts. First of all, is an almond a nut? It's not. An almond is a seed. And a peanut, is a peanut a nut? No, a peanut is a bean. So what nuts do I want you to eat for your brain? I want you to eat the nuts that actually look like a brain. So walnuts actually look like a brain, don't they? And cashews, they look like a brain too. So the two nuts that you're gonna focus on are walnuts and cashews. And then you're gonna intersperse a few macadamia nuts in there because they're really good for your brain too. And some pistachio nuts because those are all nuts and nuts are really good as anti-inflammatory foods. Berries we've talked about, vegetables, green vegetables, yes, but also red vegetables and root vegetables. Any type of vegetable is anti-inflammatory. Is a potato a vegetable? It is a vegetable, but it's also a starch. So I don't want you to focus on potatoes as your only source of vegetable. I want you to look at the more color you get, the better it is for you. And you can always take antioxidants as vitamins as well. So our antioxidant vitamins include vitamin D, vitamin A, and vitamin C. Vitamin D, how much vitamin D should you be getting? If you look at the recommended daily allowance, you'll see that it's one to 2000 units of vitamin D per day. Now, here's what I want to tell you. You use up 3000 units of vitamin D per day if all you do is sit on the couch. 
And you're probably not just sitting on the couch. You're probably getting a little bit more activity than that. So what the average recommendation is for someone with Parkinson's is 5,000 units per day. So you may not be getting enough vitamin D. Check out how much vitamin D you're getting. And if you're not getting enough, it's also going to help you fight infection, which is really good in this time of year. Vitamin A. Vitamin A is really good at reducing inflammation. And we used to get all the vitamin A we needed if we drank a glass of orange juice. But it turns out that our soil is depleted these days. And we're using different varieties of oranges than what we used to use. I don't know if you remember, but 20 years ago, oranges were like the size of a baseball. And now you go to the grocery store and oranges are like the size of a football. Well, not quite a football, but they're huge, right? It turns out they're mostly water and there's not enough vitamin A in an orange anymore. You would have to eat 20 of those giant oranges to get the same amount of vitamin A you got in one orange 20 years ago. So you might want to start taking a vitamin A supplement or a multivitamin that has vitamin A in it. And then vitamin C. And again, vitamin C, we always used to think oranges, let's get our orange juice, right? And again, vitamin C, it's not, it's not as prevalent in oranges as it used to be. So as much as I do want you to eat some citrus, I also want you to make sure you're getting enough of your antioxidants because we know the oxidative stress that's happening in your brain is increasing disease progression. So having antioxidants is good. We'll also get those antioxidants from our foods, from berries and tomatoes and citrus. And then there's antioxidant supplements that people with Parkinson's have been taking for a long time. Oh, cuties are great, by the way, and cuties uh, have vitamin A in them, but again, you're going to have to eat about six cuties for a daily serving of vitamin A. And Heather, uh, I'm, can you, I'm sorry, we, we had a question about specific amounts of yeah, so vitamin B12 also, as well as A, if they were going to take the supplement. So for vitamin B12, it, uh, it depends on if you're on medication or not. If you're on carbidopa or levodopa, um, so I will admit that I am a, um, a gummy vitamin connoisseur, um, and I take four B12s a day. So um, if you get it in a gummy form, I think it's 100 milligrams per gummy, and I do 400 gummies per day. Um, for vitamin A, you're looking at 500 milligrams per day, and usually that's a single dose, or you can get vitamin A. I don't know if you have, if you have gastroparesis and you have trouble swallowing vitamin A and vitamin D are also available as liquid drops. And so you can just put a couple drops into water and it's way easy to swallow it that way. Cuties are the little tiny oranges. Um, they're like a cross between an orange and a mandarin. And um, they are also packed with good citrus uh, antioxidants. So um, that's another, another thing to do. So, so if you're taking carbidopa, levodopa, you are depleting your, your B12. So you may have to take twice as much as B12 as I take because I don't have Parkinson's. So you might need to take like 800 milligrams a day instead of 400 milligrams per day. And you'll be able to tell by how much your tremor um, is going away. What you should remember is that B12 also makes you feel very alert. So if you're going to take it, you want to take it in the morning or you won't sleep at night. Okay. So B12 is one of those wide awake vitamins. All right, the supplements um, that have been studied in people with Parkinson's include CoQ10. And there were a number of studies, three or four epidemiological studies um, that showed that CoQ10 was protective in people with Parkinson, Parkinson's. It's a really good antioxidant. The issue with CoQ10 is that they then went and did a really large randomized controlled trial. And in the randomized controlled trial, CoQ10 only worked on about 30% of people with Parkinson's. Now, the big thing that was different was dose. The people who were using CoQ10 in the epidemiological studies were using much higher doses. So we know that if you take CoQ10, you have to take over 600 milligrams per day. 
Keep in mind that the average CoQ10 supplement has 100 milligrams per capsule or per gummy. So that means you're going to have to take six per day and that gets expensive. So what I would say is try CoQ10, try 600 milligrams per day. By the way, the clinical trials also went up to 1200 milligrams per day. So it could be that you need a much higher dose, but try it, see if it works for you. If you're one of the 30 to 40% of people it works for, fantastic. And you will notice a reduction in a lot of your symptoms. Ubiquinol is a great form of CoQ10. Um, it, it is reported to be better absorbed than CoQ10. However, there's actually no research showing that that's true. It's just a marketing gimmick. Um, so you could take straight up CoQ10 or you can take ubiquinol. For vitamin D, you want D3. D2 is not as well absorbed. Usually you only would get D2 if a physician prescribes it to you and then they prescribe 50,000 units of D2. When you can buy D3 at Walmart and in a gummy form and they're delicious, okay? Glutathione. Glutathione is another antioxidant that's been shown to help people with Parkinson's. Um, there is a form available on the internet that is snortable. The idea was that it would go directly into your brain. However, when they did a clinical trial, they showed that the snortable glutathione wasn't any more effective than taking glutathione. So in terms of glutathione, again, take it, see if you feel better. If you feel better, continue taking it. If you don't, stop. The other two antioxidant supplements are spirulina and ginseng. And both of these, again, have been shown to, in animal models, reduce uh, progression of Parkinson's. Now, here's the problem. When we do an animal model, we don't know how to extrapolate the dose to a human dose, right? A mouse is little. So again, the dosing here is something that you would experiment with on your own. Is there a risk in taking any of these antioxidants? Vitamins D, A, and K and E for that matter are absorbed into fat and you could take too much of those. How much is too much? Well, if you're taking 150,000 units per day, it's been shown to be toxic. I'm telling you to take 5,000 units per day, okay? So you're way, way, way below the level of toxicity with 5,000 units. Um, there's evidence for people taking 25,000 units a day and being fine. So vitamins D and A, you don't wanna take over 100,000 units per day, but taking vitamins um, D and A have been shown to be uh, effective for people with Parkinson's. And I don't know about uh, E and K. I haven't seen, it, seen any research on that. All right, back to cooking. Cooking with spices. I want you to use spices. And the reason is there are a few spice studies in animal models of Parkinson's that show that spices in these animal models can stop Parkinson's in its tracks. All of these herbs, oh, I have a typo, that should be turmeric. Um, all of these herbs, Ceylon cinnamon, rosemary, and curcumin are being developed into drugs for people with Parkinson's. They're all being developed into drugs. Do you know how long it takes for an herb to be made into a drug? Got a guess? About 22 years. I know. That means that you may not see these drugs in your lifetime, but you can sure cook with these spices, right? Now you'll notice I put Ceylon cinnamon. And this is important. If you get your cinnamon from China, it often is contaminated with heavy metals, mostly because they haven't regulated their industry there. The heavy metals are belched into the sky and then it rains down on the cinnamon. And when they harvest the cinnamon, there's heavy metal on it. So if you get your cinnamon as Ceylon cinnamon, and it's, or, it's available as organic Ceylon cinnamon on Amazon, now you don't have to worry about heavy metal contamination. And we worry about heavy metal contamination specifically for people with Parkinson's because you don't tend to detoxify metals very well. 
Rosemary you can get anywhere, but the rosmarinic acid in rosemary has been shown to be protective. And like I said, in a mouse model, completely stopped um, Parkinson's in its tracks. So think about how you can cook with rosemary. And turmeric or curcumin is another one. It's available as a supplement. But what I want to say again is heavy metal contamination is huge, especially if the turmeric or curcumin is from India. So you're looking for a good brand. I like the brand Pure Encapsulations because they, they third-party test their curcumin and they make sure that it is pure. I also like Thorn, T-H-O-R-N-E. Pure Encapsulations and Thorn are the two that I use for curcumin. Nightshades. We want you to eat nightshade vegetables. This is really fun. So eggplant, tomato, peppers, and then potato are the last of the nightshades. But do you know why nightshades are protective for people with Parkinson's? You're not gonna guess this one. Nightshades contain nicotine and nicotine is protective for Parkinson's. So I'm not gonna tell you to take up smoking. Okay, don't do that. We don't need you to get lung cancer, but we know that um, nightshades are protective. Eggplant has the second highest level of nicotine after tobacco, and then peppers, and then tomatoes. And so eating these vegetables is good for you. Now, what they're doing to study nicotine in Parkinson's is they are giving people nicotine patches and showing that nicotine patches can also be helpful, um, especially for tremor. So if tremor is one of your issues, you might try a nicotine patch or you might um, do eggplant, peppers, or tomatoes. Flesh of eggplant. Um, now here's what's interesting. If you have arthritis, nightshades make your arthritis worse, especially tomatoes. They will make your, um, your arthritis worse. But for Parkinson's, they're protective because of the nicotine. So if you're someone who has both, you may not want to increase your nightshades. You may want to go back and do those spices instead. But if you don't have bad arthritis, then nightshades could be a good thing. Or try the nicotine patch. What about beverages? Coffee. Coffee has been shown to be protective for Parkinson's and actually for all cause mortality. And here's what's really interesting. One cup of coffee is good. Two is better. Three is better. Four is better. Up to five cups a day. Whoa. Right now, what that doesn't take into account is how much you have to pee. So if you have to go to the bathroom a lot and you're slow getting to the bathroom, you may not want to be drinking five cups of coffee a day. But in terms of protection, coffee can actually be really good for reducing inflammation. Notice I said coffee. I did not say double caramel macchiato with extra whip, right? Coffee is good for you. The research is on eight ounces of coffee. It's not on the Starbucks um, sugar fest that we like to call, call coffee. And caffeinated has been shown to be better than decaf, but decaf is better than no coffee. And better than coffee yet is green tea. In fact, in epidemiological studies, they've shown that green tea can ward off the symptoms of Parkinson's for up to seven years. Green tea, how much? Three eight ounce cups of green tea per day. Okay, so three eight ounce cups of green tea per day. Now you can do green tea as a beverage or you can use matcha and matcha is the dried green tea. And I have folks with Parkinson's who are using matcha in their pesto. So they'll throw some matcha into pesto and they'll put it on pasta and deliciousness, or they put it on their salmon, really good. So if you can't do green tea, um, you might try uh, matcha. If the caffeine doesn't work for you, remember everybody's different. And I think what we're ultimately going to see is that Parkinson's is going to be grouped into like five different 
diagnoses. It's not just going to be everybody has Parkinson's. So some of you are going to respond really well, and some of you are not going to respond as well. So if caffeine increases your tremors, then don't do caffeine. Then go back and do some of the other things that we're talking about here. What about alcohol? Well, red wine is is full of those anthocyanins that we see in berries, right? That's what gives it its red color. So if you're going to drink red wine, if you're going to drink wine, make it red wine, white wine is essentially sugar. And we're gonna talk about the effects of sugar here in just a second. So if you're gonna drink wine, you're gonna go red wine. Now, the other problem with red wine is that red wine tends to be heavily sprayed the grapes tend to be heavily sprayed with pesticide. So if you're drinking wine, you're going to really want to go with an organic wine. Okay, so red wine, but organic. What about beer? There's exactly one study looking at Parkinson's and beer, and it shows that one glass of beer per night totally fine for people with Parkinson's. You go much higher than that and it's not so good. It's been shown to increase a lot of different symptoms, but one glass per night, not a problem. Hard alcohol, it's just sugar. So no hard alcohol. What about fats? Fats are protective for people with Parkinson's. So for fats, we're talking about fish oil um, and again, if you're going to use fish oil, I want you to use an organic form. It's really the omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil that are protective. And so um, you, can, you can take a whole fish oil supplement. If you do, I like Nordic Naturals. That's the brand that I, I tend to recommend. Or you can take omega-3 fatty acids and bypass the fish oil. Olive oil, also protective for Parkinson's, but it actually is a completely different mechanism than fish oil. It actually is reducing your blood glucose. And it's doing that by affecting this enzyme called GLP-1. And so olive oil is good for Parkinson's, but it's good for you because you're reducing um, your blood sugar. Now, olive oil has what we call a low smoke point. A lot of people like to cook with olive oil and they like to fry with it, but olive oil should not be fried because it, um, it actually makes the oil the equivalent of rancid and that can make it inflammatory. So if you're going to cook with an oil, coconut oil is actually a really good oil to cook with and it has what we call medium chain uh, fatty acids in it. The medium chain triglycerides are protective and especially protective for memory. So this has been studied in Alzheimer's disease, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, um, avocado oil, good to cook with, grapeseed oil, good to cook with. Both of those are better than olive oil for cooking. Olive oil is really good as a cooler oil. So for salad dressings, um, using an olive oil is really good or uh, dipping bread in or that sort of thing. Great, use your olive oil. But for cooking, um, use an oil that has a higher smoke point. All right, so we have talked about increasing our brain food with berries and nuts and fish. We've talked about decreasing inflammation with vegetables, with antioxidants, with oils. Now we're gonna spend some time talking about decreasing chemicals. So we're gonna move on to what not to eat. And the first thing is gonna be sweets. When we eat sweets, we change, um, a lot of things in our body, but mostly our blood glucose, and that increases inflammation. We don't want inflammatory foods, and um, we have a, a study of people with Parkinson's that's out of Seattle, where they've studied people who are slow progressors versus people who are fast progressors. And one of the big things they see in people who are fast progressors is they tend to eat more canned foods. And we think the reason that canned foods are, are or were problematic is that the cans used to be lined with what we call BPA. 
And we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, in 2017, there was a huge outcry because of the BPAs in, in canned foods, and they switched it to vinyl. So now our cans are lined with vinyl, and we're not sure if vinyl is any better than BPA yet. So what I usually say is just try to stay away from canned foods. Buy these foods like, like corn or beans, buy them frozen instead of buying them canned. And let's get rid of those BPAs. And then chemicals and preservatives. We're gonna to wanna to reduce chemicals and preservatives as well. So let's break this down a little bit more. The first thing is sweets. And the first conversation we need to have is about high fructose corn syrup. So high fructose corn syrup has two different issues with it. The first issue is what you might imagine. And that is that it is designed to spike your blood glucose and make you feel really good. But what that means is that when you have high fructose corn syrup and we measure the sugar in your blood, um, it goes very high. So we did a research study here, which showed that the, the blood sugar, we'll just set that at 100, right? So if you drink high fructose corn syrup, it'll take your blood glucose up to 100. If you drink something with sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup, it takes it to 50. So it still takes it up, but it, it's like half as much as high fructose corn syrup. Whereas if you do honey or agave or maple syrup, it takes it to 30. And if you use stevia, it takes it to minus 10. It actually reduces your blood sugar. So high fructose corn syrup is problematic for everybody. Nobody needs their blood glucose going that high. But there's an additional issue that we have for people with Parkinson's. And that is that in 2009, the EPA started looking at high fructose corn syrup companies, and they discovered that when high fructose corn syrup is being manufactured, they use mercury to uh, get the fructose out of the corn. And the mercury was disappearing from the manufacturers of high fructose corn syrup. And where was it going? Directly into the products. Now, it wasn't just a little bit of mercury. It was 8 million tons of mercury per plant per year. That's a lot of mercury. So then the EPA went to the shelves of the grocery stores and they started pulling items off the shelf that had high fructose corn syrup to see if that's where the mercury was. And indeed, they started finding mercury. And we would expect that in soda, right? Coke, Pepsi, that's all high fructose corn syrup in the United States. But what we didn't expect was that it was in things like yogurt and peanut butter and ketchup and all these um, products that have high fructose corn syrup in them, Quaker instant oatmeal, um, Hershey's chocolate syrup, like all these things that, that people are eating that they don't know that they're getting exposure to mercury. So the EPA gave the companies 10 years to clean up their act, and that was 2019. And when the EPA tried to go back to the companies, they wouldn't let, let them on the land. So that suggests to me that they haven't fixed it yet. Now, some of the companies who found mercury in their products are, have behaved very responsibly. So if you look at YoPlay yogurt, they completely changed their formula and now they just use sugar, no high fructose corn syrup. Likewise, if you go buy, buy ketchup, you can buy ketchup with sugar or you can buy organic ketchup and you can get the high fructose corn syrup if you need it or want it, but you don't have to have high fructose corn syrup in your ketchup anymore. Whereas other companies just said, you know, whatever, this is, this is the cheapest way to make this product because that's why we use high fructose corn syrup is it's subsidized um, and they continue to do that. You don't want high fructose corn syrup because you don't want mercury. Mercury goes straight to the brain. So we don't want mercury in your products. I would rather have you have sugar than high fructose corn syrup. Don't want you to have sugar either because sugar also brings your blood glucose up and we're starting to call one form of Parkinson's and one form of Alzheimer's, it's called type three diabetes because we know it's highly responsive to blood glucose. So what could you do instead? Well, I don't want you to do uh, artificial sweeteners, no artificial sweeteners. Um, 
because artificial sweeteners are also neurotoxic. In fact, Splenda, I'm going to tell you a really funny story about Splenda. Do you know how Splenda was discovered? They were making airline fuel and one of the guys stuck his finger in it and it was sweet. In fact, it's 600 times sweeter than sugar. Splenda is not good for you, okay? It's a chemical that is no good. What I would much rather have you do is honey, maple syrup, agave, monk fruit, stevia. Absolutely. Those are so much better. They are, they are whole plant sweeteners and they do not have the same effect on your blood glucose and they are not as dangerous for your brain. So if you can do stevia, fantastic. Some people get an aftertaste with stevia. I don't, I like stevia, but if you can't maple syrup, honey, um, honey is also good for allergies. So, you know, you get a twofer there. Um, don't eat inflammatory foods, by the way, am I telling you to not eat any sweetness at all? No. I mean, if you could get all your sweetness from berries, more power to you, but if you need some sweetness, you can do honey and maple syrup. Um, and it's only going to increase your blood glucose by a third compared to what high fructose corn syrup does. What are inflammatory foods? I don't want you eating foods that are inflammatory. I know they can be delicious, but charring meat, that's called advanced glycosylation end products. And we don't want you to have that. Now, it is perfectly fine with me if you char a prime rib and you just cut off the charred part and eat the part that is not charred, that's okay. But I don't want you to eat the charred part. The charred part, while it may taste good to you, it is inflammatory. So we're, we're thinking about reducing inflammation, right? I'm gonna go back to beef for one second. Um, there's been a lot of talk about whether you should eat beef at all. The thing with beef is that it is more about how the cow is raised. If you are eating cow that is raised on grass and um, no pesticides, it's actually been shown to have as healthy a fatty acid profile as salmon. And so it's not that beef is evil. Beef is actually perfectly fine if you're getting good beef, high quality beef. The problem is a lot of the beef that you um, get from the supermarket is not high quality beef. Beef that's raised on feedlots tends to have um, a much higher concentration of an inflammatory compounds in it. So if you're going to eat beef, go organic and go grass fed. All right. Environmental toxicity. Environmental toxicity um, is that we know that 70% of people with Parkinson's have an environmental component and 30% of people with Parkinson's, it's genetic. What is the environmental component for people with Parkinson's? Well, environment is everything you're exposed to, including food. And specific to Parkinson's, we can show that there's pesticides, there's polychlorinated biphenyls. This is the stuff that used to be in cans, canned goods. There's solvents. Think, think of like cleaning paintbrushes, solvents. There's metals, heavy metals, like we just talked about mercury, but also lead is a big one. And then there's air pollution. And so in terms of Parkinson's, we know that these things are important. Might there be other things that are specific to Parkinson's? Absolutely. And I saw in the chat um, things about like shampoo and your, your laundry detergent. Yes, indeed, that may have an effect, but there, as of right now, there's no research showing those effects. Whereas there is research showing these other things have an effect. So we're trying to reduce these chemicals in your food and in your food um, packaging. So the first thing I say is avoid pesticides. Um, you may have seen the first class action lawsuit is happening now with Parkinson's and pesticides. And what we think is happening is that pesticides being sprayed on our foods is killing the microbes in our gut. 
Let me restate that. You eat a pesticide that is sprayed on the food and it kills the microbes that are in your gut. And the reason that's important is that there was a study out of Finland um, in 2015 that shows if these microbes are not happy in your gut, it causes difficulty walking. This was a huge surprise to all of us. Like we not, none of us in the research field thought that the gut microbes were related to gait difficulty or, or difficulty walking for people with Parkinson's, but it turns out they are. So avoid pesticides because if you kill the gut bacteria, then we have to figure out ways to replace them. And unfortunately the gut bacteria that die are really hard to replace. Now we know that if you're eating nuts and seeds and vegetables and getting a bunch of fiber in your diet, we can grow enough of the bacteria back to make a difference. Um, and if you're eating meat and it's organic and you do bone broths, so this is when you boil the bones until the bones break and you get the actual bone marrow from the meat, that's actually really good for helping replace those microbes that are missing. When I say fiber, what am I talking about? The vegetables that are the healthiest vegetables for replacing your gut bacteria are probably not what you're thinking. So when I'm thinking of replacing gut bacteria, I'm not thinking about tomatoes and kale and leafy greens. I'm thinking about the vegetables that have a lot of fiber. So onion, leeks, garlic, artichoke, asparagus, um, avocado, all of those types of vegetables are fantastic for getting that fiber and getting those microbes to regrow. There's a group called the Environmental Toxicity and um, Food Safety Group, the Environmental Working Group, and they have what they call the Dirty Dozen, which are the top pesticide rich foods each year, you'll see this is from 2021 because they haven't put out their, um, their list for 2022 yet. But for 2021, you can see strawberries are number one. And wait a second, I just told you to eat strawberries. If you're gonna eat something on the dirty dozen list, you wanna buy this as organic. The things on the clean 15 list, these are the foods that have the least amount of pesticides in them. And yes, you'll have a copy of these slides. And so you can look at this and you can also Google the Environmental Working Group's uh, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 list, and it's in the chat window. So you can absolutely get the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. And these guys, you wanna make sure you buy organic. And the Clean 15, if you buy conventional, it's totally fine. Still wash them, but they are less toxic than the um, Dirty Dozen. And I want to bring up one food in particular, and that is apples, because I love apples. I grew up in Minnesota and, you know, apples are a huge, huge uh, staple for us. There was a study out of Harvard where they went into Boston supermarkets and they took apples and different fruits off the shelf. And then they threw them into a food ninja, digested them and measured the amount of pesticide in the apples and honey crisp apples had 300 fold more pesticide in the apple meat itself than any other apple on the shelf. The reason for that is that what they've started doing is they've started spraying the pesticides at the base of the apple tree so that it goes up into the tree and into the fruit. And that way you don't get the same worms in the apple meat. The problem is then you can't wash out that pesticide. So you can scrub to your heart's content and you're still gonna have pesticide in those apples. So if you're gonna eat apples, please eat them organically. I also want you to limit your dairy. And this is where people tend to start getting angry with me um, because they don't wanna limit their dairy. But here's the, here's the issue with dairy. We've got two issues. The first issue is that dairy breaks down a substance called uric acid. Uric acid is protective for people with Parkinson's and dairy is breaking it down. Now, you may have heard of uric acid before. Uric acid is um, what accumulates in gout in your toes. 
And so if you have gout, we want to feed you dairy to break down that uric acid. But if you have Parkinson's, uric acid is protective. So I don't want you to have dairy because I don't want you to have um, uric acid breakdown. And in fact, uric acid is so protective for people with Parkinson's that there's a drug that came on the market for Parkinson's two years ago that is uric acid based. Don't take dairy because you don't want to break it down. The second thing with dairy is that dairy is one of the most pesticide rich foods that we have in the United States. Okay, so dairy is pesticide rich. Why? Think about it. What is a cow doing? A cow is eating all the grasses around it, right? And it's concentrating everything it eats into milk for the baby cow. And so if it eats pesticides, it concentrates the pesticides into the milk, especially into fat. And those pesticides then go directly into the milk product. And especially in the fat layer of the milk product. So what's getting the most pesticide? Ice cream, no ice cream. I know this is where you hate me now, right? But don't hate me because there are so many alternatives. There's really, really good ice creams out there. And think about this. I told you to have coconut. There's coconut bliss ice cream. It's made out of coconut milk. I told you to eat nuts. Look, there's cashew nut ice cream. It's made out of cashew milk. And if you have not tried these, they are fantastic. They're so good. So I want you to eat ice cream if you do alternative ice cream. How about gelato in Italy? So what you may realize is that in Europe, they have very different rules on pesticides than we do. In France and Italy, pesticides are not allowed. And so if you are in Europe and you can get dairy that is pesticide free, you may say, well, that's fantastic, here I go. But don't forget the uric acid dairy breaks down uric acid. So I don't want you to have um, uric acid breakdown. So no dairy, no cherries either, by the way, cherries also break down uric acid. Um, so cherry and dairy, sorry. But you can't have dairy, but you can still have dark chocolate, right? So dark chocolate is actually protective for Parkinson's because it's an antioxidant and it contains quercetin, which is the same ingredient that's in coffee, although it doesn't have the same level of caffeine as coffee. Now you'll notice I put not milk chocolate because milk is dairy and we don't wanna break down uric acid. Now I always get the question, what about goat milk? Is goat milk break down uric acid? Goat milk doesn't break down uric acid as much as cow dairy does. However, have you guys ever seen what a goat eats? We tried to raise goats for a few years. Goats will eat anything. They'll eat metal cans. They'll eat garbage. You do not want milk from a goat, um, in my humble opinion. If you are trying to clean up your diet, a goat is not a good way to do it. Sheep, yes. Sheep cheese, mm, delicious, try it. There's something called euphoria, E-W-E phoria, way better for you than cow's milk or goat milk, okay? So, and yes, yogurt is dairy, unless you get coconut yogurt or cashew yogurt, and those are available and they're good for you. And soy yogurt is anti-inflammatory. So all of those alternatives, really good, okay? Oh, good, I won somebody over, woohoo! I want you to avoid heavy metals. And when I say avoid heavy metals, um, I'm not telling you to avoid the pistachios. I actually want you to eat the pistachios. Pistachios contain lithium and lithium is often deficient in people with Parkinson's. And that's one of the things that contributes to depression. So eat some of your pistachios every day to help your mood. Manganese is often excess in um, people with Parkinson's. And what's interesting is if you have excess manganese, the symptoms are rigidity, bradykinesia, and great dis gait disturbance. So how can you decrease your manganese? You can increase your iron and calcium rich foods. If you increase your iron and calcium rich foods, it will automatically decrease your manganese. 
And heavy metals are sometimes found in fish. So the fishes that have been shown to have heavy metals in them are swordfish, shark, king mackerel, and tilefish. I want you to avoid those. But I do want you to eat fish because salmon has been shown to be really good for people with Parkinson's. And here's a way to think about when I'm telling you to eat all of these foods. This is actually data from a study from the American Gut Project in San Diego. And what they showed is they were trying to come up with what are foods that are best for our gut, that are gonna make those little microbes in our gut healthy, which we know are unhealthy in people with Parkinson's because pesticides have killed them or heavy metals have killed them. So they looked at different types of diets, like an omnivore diet, a vegetarian diet, omnivore with no red meat, vegetarian who eats seafood, vegan. And they thought that they were gonna find that vegans were out here in the healthy window. And what they found was that everybody was out here in the healthy window if they ate 30 plant-based foods per week. 30 plant-based foods per week. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of plant-based foods, isn't it? Can you eat 30 plant-based foods per week? This isn't 30 servings. This is diversity. This is 30 plant-based foods per week. So what I'm going to tell you is get your 30. I want you to eat 30 plant-based foods per week. Now, if you're starting at one or two plant-based foods per week, take your time, work your way up, but I want you to get to 30, maybe by June, okay? 30 plant-based foods per week. Keep in mind that nuts are plant-based foods. Spices are plant-based foods. Vegetables, fruits, all plant-based foods. 30 per week, 30 different plant-based foods per week. That's your take-home message. If we look at the whole diet, we've studied ketogenic diet in people with Parkinson's. There's been one study in Pennsylvania of a vegetarian diet in people with Parkinson's. The diet that I'm kind of describing with all of the vegetables and meats and oils is a Mediterranean diet, but that has actually not been studied in people with Parkinson's. And there is an anti-inflammatory diet, um, which eliminates a lot of inflammatory foods. And that has also not been studied in Parkinson's. What the ketogenic diet and the vegetarian diet showed in um, people with Parkinson's is that it was roughly 30% of people did better on a ketogenic diet. And in the vegetarian study, roughly 30% of people did better on a vegetarian diet. How do we know who's going to do better on which diet? We don't. You just have to experiment on yourself at this point. Try a ketogenic diet or try a vegetarian diet or try a Mediterranean diet and see which one works for you. We also know that meal timing is important, right? That we know that, um, you should not be eating protein within two hours of your levodopa. But that doesn't mean that you can't eat berries. Berries don't have any protein in them. So you could take levodopa and eat your berries at the same time and then delay any other protein source for somewhere between one and two hours. And that way, um, you're not going to interfere with the absorption of levodopa. So just remember, there's no protein in berries. The other thing that's being studied right now is what's called intermittent fasting. And what we're suggesting for people with Parkinson's is that you do a 12 hour fast. I'm not telling you now don't eat anything. I'm saying between 7 p.m. at night and 7 a.m. in the morning, no food. That also means no beverages. It's not like you put, close the refrigerator and you drink wine the rest of the night. No calories between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., okay? So what that does is it gives your brain a time to slow down inflammation before you add the next inflammatory thing. And I'm hoping that you're gonna stop eating a lot of inflammatory things. And then you'll have less neuroinflammation and less symptoms. So here's our summary. I want you to eat berries, eat salmon and, and good fishes, eat spices, eat nuts, green tea, and vegetables, and don't eat 
artificial sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup, sugar, dairy, or trans fats, or advanced glycosylation end products for that matter. Remember that every time you eat is an opportunity to nourish your body, so eat wisely. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I have time to stay on for an extra couple of minutes to uh, answer some questions. Um, is that okay, Anissa? Um, we actually had a lot of questions. So um, if people want to stay on, we will go through some of them because um, you had such great information. And for those of you who cannot stay on, let me just quickly say that this is being recorded and will be available in the next 24, 48 hours. You also might want to save your chat because we put in a lot of different links and information. So you can do that by going to where you write your chats. There's the far right three little dots. If you click that, you can save your chat. Um, that way, all of the different links and um, things that we mentioned throughout the presentation today, you'll be able to access those. So I'm going to go back to, goodness, some of these questions that I think um, might be good for everyone in general. So one good one was when you were talking about fruits, um, dried or fruit, is there anything better yeah. or are they equal? No, you want fresh fruits. Um, the dried fruit is mostly just sugar. So if you want those healthy components in the fruit, the antioxidants and the anthocyanins and everything like that, you really want fresh fruits. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, going through the need to take supplements, of course, there's tons of questions like how much and what if. Um, so one of the things that I think when you were mentioning, you know, you have to try things out, see how you feel. Can you talk about like having that conversation with their physicians also, just to make sure there's no drug interactions because absolutely when they go to the doctor, they should also be not just telling the physician, you know, what prescription medications they're on, but also what supplements they're also taking. Yes. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. And if you live in a state where there are naturopathic physicians, naturopathic physicians are trained in drug herb interactions and they are the ones who are really good at helping you discover which supplements would be best for you so i highly recommend that you um talk to a physician or a naturopathic physician pharmacists are starting to be um, educated on this as well and if they know what medications you're on that that will help uh, determine whether there's drug herb interaction most of the things that I talked about today uh, do not have drug herb interaction. So CoQ10, there's no drug herb interaction. Glutathione, no drug herb interaction. Vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D. Where there is drug herb interaction is things like broccoli. It turns out that broccoli is really good at helping your liver detoxify drugs. And if you eat a ton of broccoli um, or you take a supplement that has a lot of broccoli in it, you will detoxify your medication more quickly. And that's not a good thing. Likewise, um, of the citruses, grapefruit helps you detoxify drugs. And so you, you wouldn't want to take a grapefruit supplement or a broccoli supplement. Um, and there are broccoli supplements out there. There's one called sulforaphane that is broccoli sprouts. Um, and that would cause you to detoxify your medication. So I suggest that you find a physician who knows about this stuff or a naturopathic physician. A lot of them do online work these days because of uh, COVID. So you can do an online um, appointment and they can help you figure out which supplements are ideal for you. All right. So we have a lot of comments in regards to the yogurt, wanting to know if if we do like an alternative, like alternative yogurts cashew are also or, yep. you know, almond, do they have this, as many of the probiotics in them? They do. And I also recommend, um, if you're looking for live foods like yogurt, um, you can do kombucha, you can do, uh, Kiva, um, all of those live foods, sauerkraut, um, for yogurt, cashew yogurt, soy yogurt, almond yogurt, all of those are really good for those live probiotics. Absolutely. And 
kind of tag onto that. So a lot of PD um, people have issues with low bone density and dairy is typically viewed as a better source of calcium. So what's a better way of supplementing the calcium? You can either take a calcium supplement or you can eat spinach, which is actually a better source of calcium than dairy. It's just that the dairy people have better marketing folk. So calcium is actually very rich in spinach. Another couple of comments or questions I've seen come through today was about wheat. Um, wheat being sprayed, is it better to uh, go with a gluten-free diet? What are your thoughts about that? So wheat, I call this lecture Parkinson's 101 for, dare, for um, diet. Wheat is coming in 201, right? It's really hard to eliminate wheat. If you can do it, absolutely great, do it. You're, the thing with wheat in the United States is, is that first of all, it is sprayed after it is harvested. So it is not sprayed with pesticide when it is grown, but after it's harvested, then we spray our wheat with pesticides so that it doesn't get mealworms. And as a result, it tends to have more pesticide than other foods because it's sprayed late in the processing. There's a second thing that happens with gluten in this country and with wheat is that we use steel plates to process our gluten and we process it into very fine particles. And as a result, we're exposing part of the plant that our bodies aren't used to seeing. And so we have more people reacting with an inflammatory reaction to wheat in the United States than they do in any other country. So stone ground is much better than steel plate ground. Third thing with gluten, if you have sourdough, the bacteria in sourdough actually break down the inflammatory components of the gluten. And so sourdough tends to be a whole lot less inflammatory. And if you have organic sourdough, woo, you've just hit the jackpot, right? Um, I don't say no wheat. I often will suggest Ezekiel bread, which is usually found in the frozen food section because it is stone ground and it is um, organic. So Ezekiel bread might be something that you would try. And again, I don't usually do eliminating wheat first. If you can make the 30 plant-based foods per week, that's step one. Then start switching over your wheat to something that's healthier. And I know there were some comments about, wow, that's a lot, a lot of, a lot of things to change when you're maybe a care partner and you're trying to just navigate your day. Do you have any words of wisdom to just kind of help people um, maybe just make small changes over a period Absolutely. of time and, and maybe some tips on that? So one of the things that my... Uh, I, I think they wrote in the chat, my book is currently in the rewriting stage. Um, but one of the things that I recommend in the book is that you take a full year to transform your diet and start small, just eliminate ice cream. Look at what the changes are going to happen. Then just add some berries, then just eliminate something else and then just add something else and go back and forth with what you're adding and eliminating and do it over a long period of time. Oatmeal is fantastic, but make sure it's organic. Quaker oats are one of the most pesticide rich um, heavy metal foods that there is. I'm sorry. Bob's Red Mill, go Bob's Red Mill. It's way better than Quaker oats in terms of just what's in there. Um, so. I like oatmeal. I, I love oatmeal myself, but I just want you to get rid of the chemicals. And I do have to go now. I apologize. Well, I, haven't I really want to thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. I don't know if you saw the comments that this was like the best presentation on, you know, deciding what you need to eat, what not to eat. So thank you so much. And really quick, Heather, we have a tradition at PMD Alliance that we like to do with our speakers. And that's giving you this wave of gratitude just to yeah. thank you for your time and your expertise. And I know everyone wants to give you that wave. So thank you very much for all of thank this. You all. Thank you for joining us again. It is going to be recorded and handouts available. So look for those in about 24, 48 hours. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.